from the Oxford Dictionary, it's a Greek mythological creature that's really a combination of different animals. Or in biology, uh, it's really just a term to define something that has more than one set of DNA. Now, this is relevant to what I'm actually doing, but what I focused on was building something of a hybrid. Now, this um, project is inspired by synesthesia. And for those of you who don't know, synesthesia is a condition where people have a cross-sensory experience between uh, more than one of their senses, uh, namely sight, smell, hearing, touch, and taste. And so synesthesia is in a bit as, as uh, like a hybrid of senses. And now back in January, there's a tweet uh, that somebody shared that they could taste words. And this is not uh, the only case of synesthesia, but some people can see words with different colors or letters that are associated with different sounds. And so this person asked out um, a bunch of folks that asked what their name tasted like, and I had to look out what our professor's names might taste like. And I was very pleased to find that Dr. Campbell's name tastes like minty chewing gum, and Dr. Bob's name tastes like a gnome's head, which if you bite it off, is filled with strawberry cotton. Um, needless to say, I'm not going to start rolling out trays of strawberry fondant, but I did choose to <laughs> use the senses of sight and hearing and mix those together in my capstone. Um, the initial concept of this uh, kind is really this Greek letter, um, it's a Greek letter, and it looks a little bit like an X, which I thought was neat because I'm trying to replicate a cross sensory experience. A mirror is a Spanish word for look, and it's really the eyes of the project. Or about a camera, a light, and some colored objects where is where it's a source of what will become sound. And so what I have here is a cross-sensory experience of both the, the visual aspect and the audio aspect, and also a hybrid of soft, software and hardware. Now my approach, um, at first I need a source of light, I also need something to capture the action that's going on, and after taking that, I need to differentiate the different between different colors, um, possibly even between the same color, and then do something with that data and create the sound. So start with the easier part. Uh, the harder part is really just uh, putting together something that will give me a video feed of what's going on and what kind of colors that I want to have. Um, some problems that we ran into in, uh, included having some shadows or reflections of the objects that I used. Uh, the first webcam that I used had this autofocus function where if I put my hand in, it would refocus, and if I took it out, it would refocus once again into something I didn't want. Um, lastly, I need some type of solid colors, so something that was a uh, gradient or something that was spotted or had patterns wouldn't be ideal, but some, I needed something that was solid and also quite easy to move. Uh, my first trial, I used different pieces of paper, which worked for color, for solid colors, but uh, it's a little bit hard to pick up a piece of paper and put it wherever you want, really on the back. And so to fix these issues, we used, ended up using a desk lab that's clickable here, and a camera, uh, a webcam that we tried that didn't that you could turn off the autofocus for, and I also decided to use some childhood toys here to have a uh, source of color. I can tell you about it, but I think I'd rather show you. Here, um, here's my table surface, uh, courtesy of Dr. Bob. And here I have a tripod and really some wall holding that I've clamped onto it to get the proper height and depth of where I want my lighting and my camera for. I've also got this white piece of poster paper just so that it's got the right uh, white point so it doesn't change uh, brightness depending on what kind of colors I have on the surface. Now, the camera also needs to be mounted properly. And a typical webcam, you're going to flip on your laptop and it really faces forward or back. But I need mine to face down. Uh, so I need to get a custom mount for that. And if you look upwards here, this is kind of what it looks like. And it needs to face downward, which I just asked a good friend to three dimensional print something that I needed. There we go. So we will take it apart. A little bit of putting it back together. I've got myself a camera. And back where we left off, I just need some colored objects, and that really makes up the entire hardware part of, part, part of my project. So there's Mira. And for Kai, this is by far the majority of the past 
don't work. <laughs> and this is a software component of my project using the coding language Maxim as a computer. My approach was really that I needed to differentiate between different colors and track them. And I also wanted to be able to track and identify the same color if I had multiple copies of the same color. Also, by that, by that point, I also need a way to store all that data and also visualize it in a way that's easy for me or any user to use. Lastly, which is mostly the fun part, um, after you get that data, what am I going to do with it? I decided to have three different modes to apply that data to sound, uh, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later. So the majority of the code here, the problems and, and finding solutions for those problems is mostly finding the right objects, the right coding um, language or tools to use that was more appropriate for what I wanted it to do. Um, a couple objects didn't work quite well, and so we ended up finding uh, different ones that would work differently. For example, this jit.grab is exactly what we needed to do. It would take the color data in alpha RGB values and and uh, output, output those four numerical values for me. And so in that way, I can recognize the color and identify that color. And afterwards, what you get is something like this, which is me hiding behind some colored cue balls and index cards in a cafe into something a lot cleaner like this. All right, so that's tracking different colors. Um, what about um, how I'm storing that data? So this is kind of what my patch looks like uh, in one of my graphs anyways. And on the left side, you'll see a couple different colored objects. And so what happens is every tracker tracks a specific color. So the first one's red, the second one's orange, third one's yellow, and so on. And it will only see the object of that color that it's meant to be tracked. And afterwards, it'll put that all together, and I get a visualization of something like this. So I get the location and also the color of whatever it is on screen that I'm tracking. Now, this is pretty good for different colors, but what if I wanted multiple objects of the same color? I had a bit of a problem like this. Uh, clearly here we have two blue circles, but it's only really giving me one object. And really what it was doing was seeing the entire blue area as one object, even though they're quite separate. And so in maximum speed, there's an object called cd.jit.blobs. And yes, it calls it blobs. And so it would basically identify every shape as a blob, and it can actually find the bounds and track them individually. And that works. But if I have two objects, and I want, say, the first yellow to play Happy Birthday, and the second one to play Twinkle Twinkle, and I take away the first one, ideally what I want is it to continue playing Twinkle Twinkle and stop playing Happy Birthday, but it would only actually see the first object and play the wrong song. So I need a way to identify um, and uniquely um, have these blobs work independently of each other. And so there is an object called cd.jit.blobs.sort, and basically it renames the blobs um, based on their location. So if I compare one frame uh, to the frame before or the frame after based on a threshold of pixels of the area or the location of where that blob is, it would rename and reorder them to make sure that they were the same as what it was before, so they didn't all, all of a sudden switch. So if we kind of uh, look back at our data structure, it's got a little bit of a change, adding second, uh, more than one object of the same color. And here I've got the tracking working the exact same way, but now we have more objects of the same color. And instead of naming them one, two, three, and four, I needed a way to identify them and name them differently. So we added a second digit. And basically the first digit identifies what color it is or which tracker is tracking that color. And the second digit, identifies up to 10 objects that are of that color. And so this picture on the left here will visualize into something like this, labeled 10, 11, whole whack of orange dots, and the yellow and green dots in it. And that's exactly what I did. So this is a screenshot of a patch with my Lego objects that I took about a week ago, and you have the, you see here that it's working properly with the right colors and numbers, seeing them as individual uh, uh, lastly, this is, so for every one of those dots, I have an index uh, identifier number, I have its color, I have an X and Y value for its location, and also a grid X and grid Y value, which I'll get into in a little bit, and I just tag the ID along and the end. 
many but the quick and fun part here, the sound uh, that I wanted to make out of those numbers. Because right now I'm just giving a list of numbers and I haven't heard it yet. And so I decided to start a little bit simpler. I have a, a, sa a sample player and a step sequencer and also an effect unit. And so most of the problems here were just uh, a little more simple, just mapping certain values to what I wanted it to do. So if I wanted something to have a really low pitch over here, I'd take the, I guess for you, the most leftmost value and scale that to the lowest pitch I wanted. And all the way over here, I'd take the most rightmost value and scale that to the highest pitch I wanted. So if I move something this way, it would go from a low pitch to a high pitch. So here is kind of a hot screenshot of my sample play here. What it really does is just kind of have an object, it'll play a sound file. And if I have a different colored object, it will play a different sound file. And my step sequencer here is a little more fun. I actually revised this step sequencer from a previous project. And so something like this that you see on screen, the Lego objects in that specific orientation there, uh, what happens here is using those great X and Y values, where the specific X and specific Y values don't really matter. And so you can round them into a grid formation to the nearest grid coordinate that we've created. And so it'll visualize something on the right there, and to my sensor step sequencer, it'll create a rhythm that sounds a little bit like this. <coughs> So the distance, if they were closer, would have a larger effect, and if they were further apart, they'd have less effect, and if they were too far apart, they'd have no effect. And so I ended up using an object called Notes uh, in Max that was really, uh, really exactly what we wanted, because it would interpolate the weight of interaction and how much every node was affecting each other. And so I decided to pick some effects. You guys have namely have reverb to change uh, perception of how large a room sounds. Uh, pitch shifting, which does exactly that. Some delay and create a bit of an echo effect. A uh, flander and a grain stretcher, which will just stretch a tiny portion of the sample um, by creating noise. So that really ends up being the entire software component of my project. Uh, and together you have the entirety of my capsule project, which has just this hardware and the software component. Um, in the future, I think it would be really neat that instead of just looking at Lego, uh, you can have a camera facing the stage, you can have dancers with different colored leotards, and they in turn can get different sounds from their dancing movements. Or instead of playing a sound file, I can have live sound notation, a saxophonist on the side, and based on what I do on this, this tabletop, I can really mess up with what he's playing. And also using different mediums and sources of color, I can use not just solid, but Liquids um, interact very differently. So this is an artist who pours paint onto a tub, a container of water, and he paints paintings like that, liquids on liquids. And also with liquids, you can mix colors and create entirely different new colors, which I can't really do with solids. Um, this is a similar idea. These are um, Tibetan sand, a colored sand using Tibetan sand metallic, which would be a really neat um, use of color as well. Uh, last one is a simple one. This is a black light, which would be neat to implement because all I can do is just flip a switch and you have an entire set of completely different colors. Um, so that's a lot of talking, but I have a live demonstration to show you kind of how it works. I thought I'd first show you that how you can have crack different colors and also multiple instances of the same instances of the same color. And I just put together a really short one minute um, poem.